welcome to the Acupuncture Outsider podcast. My name is Richard Hazel, and in the time it takes for you to commute to or from work, I hope to have shared something of interest about orthopedic acupuncture using motor points, trigger points, myofascial slings, uh, neurofunctional acupuncture, segmental treatments, anything that crosses my mind that seems to be of interest. I hope you'll enjoy it. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Acupuncture Outsider. This is Richard Hazel. And before uh, I get into the topic I wanted to discuss this week, I'm going to ask you for a favor. If you if you listen on iTunes, it is possible on iTunes to leave reviews. Um, Spotify does not allow that. If you listen on you know YouTube, my YouTube channel, or on the you know on Facebook um, where I post the uh, video recording, um, you you know you won't be able to really leave any sort of comments or review. But I iTunes, according to my statistics, about half of you use iTunes or or not iTunes, but um, what's it called? Apple Music um, or Apple Podcasts? Yeah, Apple Podcasts. So, sorry, I'm an Android person, so that's why I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, so what I'm asking is if you could please leave a, a nice review. Um, there are currently only two and one person left a one star review with no comments. And <laughs> I have no idea who that was. Um, it made me chuckle though. I did, it did, it did bring a smile to my face cause I don't, <laughs> I have no idea if they came across my podcast and they just were so disgusted that they decided they had to go to the review section and click on one star. I mean, it takes effort to leave, (laughs) to leave a one star review. So I just, um, so anyway, so I don't have a 5.0 record on, on the reviews there. I have like a 4.8. Um, so (laughs) if it moves you to, to, uh, support me, I would appreciate it. I, I appreciate your comments. I do get um, personal um, messages from you with with nice feedback. So that does help kind of keep me motivated to continue this podcast. Um, but I'm, I was thinking, I was looking at statistics and I was thinking, how can I expand the listening audience? I, I think about the statistics are around 500 people listen to my podcast per week, um, which I think is great. I'm, I'm a little niche in a niche, right? And I've only been doing this podcast for a little over a year. So I don't expect to be Joe Rogan with, I think he probably gets 500 listeners per minute. Um, but 500 per week, I'm happy with that. But I was thinking, how can I expand into other um, mark, uh, not markets, but, um, demographics. Um, cause I look at the breakdown, of course, all of the English speaking countries are the, the top of the who's listening. Um, and then we get into some of the European countries, um, Belgium, we get into, um, like, uh, Finland, Finland's always up there. I don't know. I, I appreciate that. Um, you guys in Finland who are listening, I think that's awesome. Um, we get some in Poland. We get um, last week, 12 people from Germany were listening. But I look, you know, I'm such a, I'm such a Francophile. I, I love France and I love the French language and I love the French culture and I mean, I love German culture too. I studied German since I was in high school and I continue to study and I do love German. Um, and, I, and by the way, I, I feel most at home in Germany. Um, I love France. It's aspirational. When I'm in France, I know I'm not French. I feel how not French I am <laughs> and only 
wish I could be more French. Um, when I'm in Germany, I feel completely at home. Like, I don't know what it is about German culture and maybe my family, but um, I feel, I don't feel like I'm in another country except they have better, um, well, better architecture, food, beer, et cetera. Um, anyway, so about 13 people from Germany listened. Um, one person from France listened in the past month, I think. Um, <coughs> I think, <clears throat> I think the statistics, sorry, I think the statistics were for the week, maybe for the month, but that's all, that's not many. That's not many. And so I'm asking myself, um, how can I get more French listeners? And I'm wondering, um, if I could get, if I could solicit some feedback. Um, if you are French speaking by uh, native, do you believe that it would be, um, helpful for me to do some podcast episodes in French? And maybe I would not put them on this same podcast because of the algorithm. I think it would screw things up. Um, what I might do is do them as YouTube um, recordings, like maybe even a video podcast in French or something. But um, I also was thinking, um, obviously the people who listen from Germany are fluent in English. You're listening to me in English. But I'm curious if you could give me some feedback also about whether you are the exception um, in France and in Germany, acupuncture is supposed to only be done by medical doctors. Now we know in France, they kind of skirt the rules with a sort of like an a legal acupuncture where they are doing like energy work. And, um, it's, it's just between them and the patient if they use needles. Um, but they're supposed to be medical doctors to do acupuncture. So in my opinion, medical doctors are so ready for applying this style of acupuncture because it's, you already understand anatomy, physiology, the most common injuries. Um, you know, you understand the, the physics, you understand the rehab techniques. It's all already there. So this is really like adding this style of acupuncture to your practice is not a huge leap. Whereas for traditional acupuncturists, they have to actually learn um, more orthopedic assessment, um, innervations of muscles, the actual origin insertion and action of those muscles, how those muscles interact with other muscles how does the body compensate for pain and injury? What are the main um, muscles that will become inhibited and weak, causing other muscles to be overused and tight? Um, you know, what are the basic hip stabilizers? What are the shoulder stabilizers? Acupuncturists from a traditional background don't really focus a whole lot on those things. Because when you think in the world of meridians and chi, your, your focus is more on internal medicine. You're thinking about the internal organs and how they can support uh, the production of chi and blood and the coursing of chi and things like that. It's a completely different concept. So I think there's a market in France and Germany and Belgium where you have to be a medical doctor to do acupuncture. But I just don't know if maybe all of you guys already speak such good English that you don't even care if I make the effort to record something in German or French. Um, my Dutch is not even close to being ready for a podcast episode. But my French I could do, and my German I could do. So, um, you know, let me know. Um, my, my 
email address is info at richhazel.com, R-I-C-H-H-A-Z-E-L.com. Or you can send to rich at richhazel.com. Both of them get to me. Um, or find me on Instagram, which is at richhazel. Please, um, if you think there's anyone in your world who would listen to a similar podcast episode, but in their native language, they'd be more interested, let me know. Because I'm very happy to start recording some things in German or French, if you want. So, okay. Um, so the the topic I wanted to discuss today is um, the need for rehab, um, physical therapy or physiotherapy. We, in the world of acupuncture, um, there's an ongoing sort of internal discussion and a lot of, um, um, I don't disdain. I don't say disdain. There's a lot of um, anger in the world of acupuncture that we see a lot more physical therapists and physiotherapists doing dry needling. Um, so I'm not going to get into the dry needling debate, but I just wanted to put it out there that because of that, there's an idiom in English we say, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And, you know, the basic gist of it is don't be so broad with your rejection of something that you throw out also the good, the good things. And I think we do that a bit with physical therapy, physiotherapy. Some of us do because of the concern that the physiotherapists are using acupuncture now and um, they're using it from a dry needling perspective working on myofascial restrictions and some of them are using electric stimulation on motor points and they're calling it something like dry needle electric stimulation dry needling or something like that neuromuscular dry needling but the gist of it is it's it's motor point acupuncture it's the stuff that i'm talking about that i use and uh, for different reasons, they're abandoning the term acupuncture. So anyway, I don't want to get into the weeds about how our profession needs to um, adjust to that because it's not going away. Um, but because of that, I feel like in the world of orthopedic acupuncture, which is what, what I'm talking about we're doing, we sometimes are not sure whether we should be then referring out to physiotherapy and physical therapists um, for our pain patients. And I think we absolutely should be considering that because while we can release muscular tension, we can improve mobility, we can get stabilization better, we can even work on inhibited muscles. We can we can often um, resolve neuropathies, a drop foot, um, depending on how long after the injury it is. We can help with uh, nerve entrapment syndromes and get people much much better. But then the the question is, what's the next step for that patient? And and I wanted to say that for many people, especially if they've had an injury or they've had chronic pain, it is very useful for them to then, once they're doing much better, go into physiotherapy. And the reason is because most of our stabilization is done at a subconscious level. The subcortex and the uh, cerebellum do a lot for us that we don't have to think about. And that's awesome. And yes, we do have conscious movement of our muscles. But most of the time, when we're just 
walking around the ha- the house or walking down the street or going downstairs we do not have to actively think about all of our stabilization we just don't we have feed forward mechanisms in the transverse abdominals that will engage before we raise our arm or before we take a step we don't have to think about that we have we have a lot of stabilization that goes on in the pelvis and in the shoulders and in the neck that we just don't have to think about. Thank goodness. If we, <laughs> we had to think about every single move we made, we, just, we could not function. If you've worked with patients who do have um, a numb foot, like usually from neuropathy, they've, they, they can't feel their foot, or they have the drop foot, They have to actively think heel, toe, heel, toe when they walk, or they might trip and fall. They have to use their eyes to see where they're going because they can't feel uh, from their foot. And it really changes the way they have to move, and it it definitely affects their quality of life. Um, but But a lot of what we do is done at a subconscious level. So when we take a walk, we don't think heel, toe, heel, toe, heel, toe. It just happens that way. We learned it. It's in the subconscious. It's in the cerebellum. It's in the subcortex. So why is that important? It's important because when you've had an injury, especially if it's become a chronic issue, you move differently to avoid pain or because of weakness, you move differently. So let's say, maybe it's not even, let's say it's not even pain. Pain's easy to understand, like avoiding pain. It's easy to understand that you would um, move differently to avoid that pain. But um, more common would be something like um, weak upward rotators of the scapula. So your serratus anterior becomes weak and it's not doing the work when you raise your arm. It's just not doing what it's supposed to do because it's so tight and it's so weak, right? So what is the compensation for that? We normally will use the upper trapezius to shrug up the shoulder to do upward rotation to because of the serratus anterior not firing right. So that's a really common compensation for a serratus anterior that's become weak. Let's say that patient has had chronic neck pain and you've worked on the upper trapezius, you've worked on the levator scapulae, you get them out of pain, they're working, they're doing great, but it just keeps coming back. And maybe they do some sort of activity that involves uh, upward rotation of the shoulder. Maybe they're a tennis player. What, what is the next step? You got the serratus firing better. You've worked out muscle tension that causes their neck pain. Their upward rotators seem to be firing great. What is the problem? The problem is that their brain still uses their upper trapezius too much more than the serratus anterior. So this is where physiotherapy or physical therapy is necessary because with active um, exercises where the brain is telling the muscle how to move and even better if you can do it in front of a mirror and watch your upper trapezius, you can retrain the brain so that subconsciously you will now move in a way that will not overuse the upper trapezius and the levator scapulae. So you won't have the recurring neck problem after playing tennis. And for some people, it's um, things like CrossFit, a lot of exercise sort of stuff. But you have to relearn how to move correctly to avoid the problem from, you know, to avoid the problem coming back. And that can take time. I think they, they believe it's at least six weeks of, of regular daily 
conscious rehabilitation to retrain the brain, to lay down new neuro pathways for the subconscious to now be reprogrammed to move the correct way. This happens after pain. This happens after injury. Um, after avoiding pain for a long time, teaching somebody how to move correctly takes rehabilitation. It takes physiotherapy. We can't do all of that for our patients. We could tell them how to do things like glute bridges, right? But here's the thing. People have emotional reactions to moving the way they're supposed to move. We, When you've lived with chronic pain, you have avoided that pain for so long that your body does not want to do things that way ever again. It's learned. We don't do that because that hurts. And we have an emotional aversion to moving the right way because it used to cause us so much pain. So working with another person can be essential to getting past that fear, that that aversion to pain. It's an emotional reaction to moving the correct way. And we can do that better with the help of somebody because we we won't know that we're doing it the wrong way because it's the way our body does it. Does that make sense? You need somebody to watch you doing something, sometimes with a little bit of weight or resistance, and then spotting where you're doing it the old way and remind you how to do it the right way and with their help move through that part of your brain that's saying, no, don't do that because it hurts so that you can retrain and learn to move the right way so that it won't continue to come back. So the problem won't continue to come back because if you continue to use the muscles that are not meant to do the action that you're supposed to do because they're not the strongest at it, they will continue to get tight and weak and cause the problem that you had the first time. So I'm highly recommending that you do stay open to sending your patients to rehabilitation via physiotherapy, physical therapy. Um, it's very important for somebody who's had chronic pain to then relearn how to move. And that goes for people where you know, as acupuncturists, we're often the last hope. So if somebody has tried all of the medical standard of care suggestions for their problem, including surgery, and they continue to have pain, now they're very likely coming to an acupuncturist. They tried everything else. So the thing is, they may have done physical therapy before. They may have done it twice before, before surgery and after surgery. And because they're in pain still, in their mind, physical therapy doesn't work. And so we need to then explain to them that it wasn't helpful for you at the time because your muscles have gotten so short and inhibited that strengthening was not possible for you. Your maybe I'm thinking of hip problems, you know, the rotators, the deep rotators are so tight that you can't even lift your knee to go up the stairs. How are you supposed to rehab that? And, uh, you know, I feel sorry for the physical therapists who have to work through that because it's very painful for the patient and it's even worse if it's causing sciatica to have all of that hip tension. And this can be after, after a surgery. So those people will not feel like physical therapy is at all helpful. They're so happy that acupuncture has loosened up 
their deep rotators and and gotten their glutes firing better and their hip flexors are more flexible so they're not inhibiting the glutes and and they seem to be feeling great however they guaranteed are still not using their glute max the way they should be using it for things like going upstairs so they will they will their body will continue to use the deep rotators more than the gluteus maximus so they're they're going to come back to you with this problem eventually i believe if they don't really learn how to use their glute max and yes it's nice if you give them some glute bridges and show them how to use a band around you know around the mid thigh and bridge up and out and get the glute uh, gluteus medius and glute maximus firing that's all great but it's not real it's not a real world movement is it they really should be doing something with stepping up um squatting with weights depends on their age and what their what activities they're trying to get back to but if you have somebody who is still in the prime of their life and physically active and wants to go back to some sort of sport activity um maybe it's not after a hip surgery maybe it's a labral tear surgery but their their hips completely got um messed up and they want to go back to an activity um they need to use their glutes right and and bridging is a good start but it will be way better if they combine it with some physical therapy where they're working on core stabilization they're they're working through any sort of um, issues with the hip flexors and they're really maybe strengthening things that haven't been able to uh, work for a while. Those are all really helpful. Those are really important and physical therapy can be really helpful for that. So I am a fan of getting people into physical therapy after they see me, if they have a chronic issue and it seems like they're going to end up in in pain again because of what they want to go back to doing um physical therapy can be really great and so i think it's just important to put that out there um because our our profession as acupuncturists kind of sometimes i feel um has a negative feeling about the whole profession of physio physical therapy right i really we need to not do that because it's a really important part of getting people back to doing what they love to do. And um, if you happen to reach out to physiotherapists near you and develop a relationship, you can find it could be really good for your practice as well to be able to refer people to the physiotherapist and they, they know that you're not trying to steal their patients. And if they send somebody to you for some work, some dry needling, some getting muscles firing, they know you're not going to tell that patient, oh, you don't need physical therapy. Look, I got you out of pain. You're good. Um, No need to go back to that. Um, They need to trust the relationship is that you support physical therapy and, and the methodology and you work together to help the patient. So, okay, so that's that's my two cents. Um, again, my my Instagram is at Rich Hazel. My email is rich at richhazel.com. Um, please send me uh, your opinions if you're in a German-speaking or French-speaking country about any interest in me doing some podcast episodes probably a different podcast name or something um maybe i would do them on uh, on the same platform but but with the you know french market in mind or the german market in mind so that the algorithm will allow those to show up on the feed for the uh, appropriate countries okay thank you very much uh i will talk to you soon 